British Offshore Training Association, Offshore Crane Engineering, Sparrows Offshore, Water Weights, and Caledonia Training Consultancy. familiar part of the industrial scene that it's almost impossible to imagine working without them. Because they're so familiar, it's all too easy to become complacent when working with them. And this can lead to accidents. Accidents that are usually serious and unfortunately often fatal. In addition to accidents to people, millions of pounds are lost every year. Lost in damage to equipment and cargo. At the heart of safe crane operations is the need for teamwork, cooperation and confidence between the people involved, the crane operator, the slingers or cargo handlers, and where it applies, the signaler. Safe crane operations and cargo handling are directly related to each other. And in this safety program, we're going to combine the two to show how to minimize the risk of injury to people or damage to gear and equipment. Because of improved design and standards of maintenance, failures of cranes themselves are relatively rare. Operator error is also becoming less of a contributory factor in crane-related accidents because the relevant legislation means that only fully trained and competent personnel are allowed to operate cranes. The majority of problems seem to originate below the hook. And for that reason, we're going to concentrate on the cargo handling or slinging end of things. First of all, let's take a look at the different kinds of cranes and what they do. The most common on land are mobile cranes, usually fitted with a telescopic jib. They travel from site to site to perform lifts and have to put down outriggers before lifting. They cannot move with a load, and so they're restricted to lifts within their safe operating radius. Smaller cranes are mobile as well. They're usually found in construction yards, where they can travel with a load as long as the ground is reasonably level. Usually, these cranes have struck jibs. For longer term projects, where relatively light loads are lifted, there are tower cranes. They can be transported around and are self-erecting or modular. Although usually seen on building sites, they're very useful in congested areas, such as this pipe yard. High portal cranes are less familiar. They have an elevated control cab so that the operator can see into the holds of ships. These cranes are usually restricted to dock sides where they run on rails. Finally, there are pedestal cranes. Again, permanently installed and usually found on ships and offshore installations. No matter what kind of crane it is, there'll be a series of start-up checks that must be done before it's used. Obviously, the fuel, lubricant and coolant levels have to be checked. But the structure itself must be checked. Once the crane is started up, then another series of tests is needed to check braking efficiencies, limits, cutouts and alarms. It's also important that anyone else working with the crane should know what the alarms sound like and what they mean. Failing to recognize a warning can have dire consequences. have special setting up requirements when they get to their work site. The ground condition is crucial. Ideally, it'll be firm and even. But if it's not, then special precautions must be taken to spread the load from the outriggers. You must also be sure, as far as you can, that there aren't any underground facilities like drains, gas mains or water pipes that might collapse under the loading. 
Special care has to be taken when working near the edges of excavations or even quaysides. When the load comes on an outrigger, it can be disastrous if the edge collapses. There's also potential danger overhead in the shape of overhead power cables. Surprisingly, perhaps, they're all too easy to overlook. And whenever a crane has to be operated near an overhead cable, the local electricity company must be consulted. As a general rule, the crane jib must not come within the maximum operating length of the jib plus six meters distance of the power line. And if there's any doubt, then measure it out. Remember, cables can swing about in windy conditions. And remember, too, that high voltages can jump across a sizable gap. If a crane has to work any closer to a line, then the line will have to be isolated. Although pedestal cranes offshore are not going to have the hazards of power lines around, more often than not, there will be other permanent fixtures within their slew path, radio masts, flare booms, and so on. So a crane operator will have to be vigilant when moving a load around the deck. Finally, before starting to lift anything, you must take the weather into account. If there's been prolonged heavy rain, the ground will be softer. Snow showers can obscure visibility, and the dangers from high winds are obvious. In an offshore environment, there's an extra factor to consider, the sea state. If a supply ship is pitching up and down in a heavy swell, the crane operator might have to end up snatching the load, and this increases the dynamic loading on the crane. In fact, sometimes the lifting conditions might be marginal, and if this is the case, it's always the crane operator who has the final say. Everything we've talked about up to now that affects safety has been the responsibility of the crane operator. But he can't work in isolation. So let's focus on Andy as he finds out about being a signaller and a slinger and about handling cargo. Ideally, a crane operator should be able to see the load all the time. But this is not always possible and someone has to relay signals to him. There will always be a designated signaller and this will, more often than not, be the slinger. Of course, there may be radio communication, but there are also recognized standard hand signals. Andy, roll it up! Firstly, the most important signals are stop and emergency stop. Then there is take the strain or inch the load, hoist, lower, slew right, slew left, jib up, jib down. For crawler cranes, there are extra instructions associated with the crane moving. Travel towards me. Travel away from me. Remember, the crane operator always depends on clear, consistent signals. So don't improvise, and don't let yourself become distracted. Let's look at planning the lift. If it's lifting a properly packed freight container, it's going to be straightforward. The weight will be known and manifested, and the contents of the container will be evenly distributed over the floor area. As far as planning goes, all that's needed is to establish the maximum working radius of the crane operating with that load, and to ensure that the lay-down point is within that radius. Slinging and lifting bundles of pipe and tubulars is also quite straightforward, as long as the basic rules are followed. Firstly, only bundle tubulars at the same diameter. If you mix them up, the smaller ones will slide out if the load gets jarred or tilted. The slings should be positioned so that they're a quarter of the tubular length in from each end. This keeps sagging and hogging to a minimum. Each sling should be double-wrapped and choked, locked in with a wire rope grip, and secured with a tie wrap. 
making sure that the ropes don't cross over on the underside of the bundle. This stops the bundle from coming slack when it's landed. Because the slings will be in choke hitch and operating at an angle, each sling must be weighted at the total weight of the bundle. For example, two six-ton slings will be needed for a six-ton lift. Sometimes you'll be lifting more than one bundle at a time. Try to keep the slings on each bundle the same length. If you don't, there'll be problems at the other end when the load is being unhooked. Problems that'll be even worse on a moving supply ship. Containers and bundles are straightforward if you do it properly. But there will always be individual lifts, all shapes and sizes. The first thing always is to establish the weight. If it's not marked or manifested, then you'll have to weigh it using a load cell or crane weigher. Pick the appropriate slings and then lift the load just clear of the ground to check for balance and stability. If you've got the center of gravity wrong, then lower it again and reposition the slings until it's right. Planning ahead is vital. Never pick something up unless you know where it's going down and be aware of any obstructions. If you're going to lift or travel over critical equipment, then check to see if you need to put up some protective framework before you carry out the lift. Quite often, a lift that may take a few minutes may need hours of preparation and planning beforehand. Let's see how Andy gets on with handling cargo. The majority of cargo is shipped in containers or open-top units, and there are standards governing these. In the same way, there are standards governing slings and their manufacture. The most important thing is their built-in safety factor. The relationship between the load and the braking strain of the sling. This must be at least 5 to 1. And for containers, it'll be even greater to allow for unequal load distribution and the chance of snatching. Of course, slings are often used in multi-leg assemblies and their safe working load is based on them being used up to an included angle of 90 degrees. Usually, container slings will have a top lifting leg designed to hang over the side of the container so that a slinger doesn't have to scramble on top of it to hook it on. It's common sense to check every container, sling and shackle before you use it. This doesn't mean just checking identification numbers, but always looking out for any defects as well, especially if slings have been exposed to the elements for any length of time. One of the commonest accidents in cargo handling happens not when an item is being lifted or lowered, but when the doors of a container are opened. If the container hasn't been packed properly, the cargo can move around and then spill out. There is a range of safety nets and internal lashings to prevent this, but you have to rely on the packer having taken the trouble to use one of them. So don't get caught out. Be careful when you open doors. Heavy items in open-top containers require careful attention. The equipment in them is often heavy and must be packed securely, shored up with timber, for example. And don't forget, this will all add to the overall weight, so allow for it. Obviously, you want to keep the load evenly distributed if you can to keep the container level when it's lifted. When an open-top container is on the deck of a supply boat, just one wave over the deck would fill it with tons of water. So check that drainage holes are clear. If they're not, the lift offshore could be a lot heavier than expected. Always be prepared to get something repacked if it arrives in a condition that you don't think is good enough. It takes time, of course it does, but it could easily take a lot more time if equipment arrives at the installation damaged. When checking cargo, it's not a paperwork exercise. Don't just check the manifest, check the goods as well. There are one or two extra things to think about when loading ships or supply vessels. Think of the working radius of the crane offshore and put the heavier loads where they can be reached safely. And think about the chance of a load snagging with another. So don't put tubulars next to a tank 
where they could get tangled with the protection frame or even pierce the tank if they start swinging about. Remember, too, that weather conditions may be marginal offshore and can change quickly. So put priority containers, food, for example, where they could be lifted off easily. Communication is important in all areas of crane operation, but none more so than offshore. A lot of people are involved. The ship's master and crew, and the platform crew. Standard containers and cargo are not the main problem. It's the one-offs that cause the problems, because they're usually wanted in a hurry. Simple things can slip by. It has been known for people to forget to remove sea fastingers from a piece of kit, so that the crane ends up trying to lift the whole vessel. When it comes down to it, there's nothing difficult or complicated about all this. It's really just a question of knowing the legislation, being familiar with the lifting gear, slings, shackles and so on, and using your common sense. Even so, every year there are accidents involving cranes. Equipment gets damaged, and people are seriously injured, sometimes killed, working with and around cranes. So be aware of what can go wrong, and make sure it doesn't. North Sea Lifting offers a complete range of safety awareness packages. Please contact 